Ethan. Oh, Gloria with us. Uh, I understand we'll be joined by Councilwoman Rahman later. Uh, but uh, with that, let's uh, call the meeting to order, Mr. Clerk. Uh, very good. I'll call the roll. Councilmember Price. Here. Councilmember Krikorian. Here. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield present. Councilmember Rahman. And Councilmember Harris Dawson. President. Okay. Okay, we're going to start the meeting as we normally do with uh, public comment. Mr. Clark, would you give us the instructions, please? Uh, yes. Members of the public who'd like to offer public comment on items listed on the agenda should call 1 669 254 5252 and use meeting ID number 160 177. 1578 and then press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for the participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Speaker, please say your name and the items you'd like to speak on. You have three minutes, you may start. And thank you, PDQ Printing Operator, for holding two meetings at 3.30 at the same time. Overt act according to the FBI. Is that possible? Not me. I got to hear my other phone, motherfucker. They are playing music. Right. Ah, let's get some business here, done. We're here to do business. We're not here for the people. We're here to give shit away to our campaign donors, aren't we? Right. So, we're going to give away permits. We're going to give away Jedi. Please, sir, be to stay on topic, otherwise we'll... We'll ask you to participate. Well, oh, damn. Well, that ain't the FBI target himself from Inglewood. I'm so honored. I am so honored. I'm glad you know how to still speak. Yeah. Now, you see, the problem is, is that nobody knows what the hell going on here at this committee meeting. Why you got travel trade and tourism in the economic development at the same fucking time, at the same day. Nobody understand why you gotta have two city attorneys instead of one and one clerk instead of two. Nobody understand. But I understand. See what happening now, motherfucker? They start another meeting because they're not talking here. See how that shit works? That's what the current past brought from Inglewood. He teaching you how to do this shit. He did that shit. I'm like, oh, oh, I'm shit. Gonna stay on topic, otherwise we're going to have to cut you off. But, nigga, they calling me for public comment on the presentation at the same time. How am I supposed to speak? Okay, that, thank, you, thank you, caller. Next, please. Caller, please say your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller, are you there? Yes. Please say your Sarah name. McBroom. This is Sarah McBroom with Project Equity, and I wanted to quickly speak to uh, both agenda item 1907-81 and 220615. You have um, a number of items. You may start. Great. I'm a senior manager for regional partnerships with Project Equity with an organization called Project Equity, and I'm happy to be here and express my support for both items. Um, I wanted to quickly start with the legacy business program. As the original motion mentioned, we know that locally owned long-standing businesses are the backbone of the local economy here in L.A., and I just want to underscore with you today so without support, these legacy businesses truly are at risk. 
our research here at Project Equity tells us that approximately half, 50% of locally owned businesses with employees countywide have owners that are at or nearing retirement. And that accounts for about 100,000 businesses, nearly 1 million workers, and approximately $237 billion in local revenue. So we know these legacy businesses are critical for the jobs, the goods, the services they provide to residents, the revenue they generate for the city, the identity they create for the region and its diverse neighborhoods. And yet, without a succession plan and other supportive programs, these businesses, jobs, and revenue surely are at risk. Um, employee ownership, which is our area of expertise, is a powerful strategy to retain and support legacy businesses. It offers a tool for employee engagement now and an exit plan for owners in the future. We wholeheartedly support the Legacy Business Program and suggest that it includes strategies to educate business owners on employee ownership or grants to subsidize the cost of transitions to employee ownership or technical assistance from employee ownership experts like Project Equity. And we know this program would have a great impact on its own. We're happy to see the other agenda item that follows that aligns well uh, with the Legacy Business Program very quickly just to speak to the body of research demonstrating the benefits of broad-based employee ownership. It's good for business. It's good for workers. You close your time. Uh, speaker, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Good afternoon, Council Members. Rosalind Sagara with the Los Angeles Conservancy expressing our strong support for item four, a citywide legacy business program. Okay, you have legacy businesses. Oh, thank you. Legacy businesses are important community anchors and vital to our local economy. A citywide program will offer much needed funding and technical assistance to eligible longtime businesses. We appreciate your thoughtful considerations for ensuring equitable distribution of grants May we ask you to consider allowing legacy businesses in operation for at least 20 years to participate in the program, especially if they are facing imminent risk of displacement. Thank you, Councilmember Price and city staff for your leadership in creating this much needed program. The Conservancy looks forward to working together with you to ensure this program success. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. My name is Megan Terramoto, and I'm a small business counselor with, uh, based in Little Tokyo. And I'm also here to speak on item number four on the agenda. Okay, um, I'm going to Thank you. Uh, we're part of the collaborative of, Asia, of Asian American organizations that provide small counseling and technical assistance for small businesses across the city of LA. Those organization, organizations have all signed on to the recommendations that were submitted to this committee. Because of language and technology barriers, my colleagues and I have had to spend hundreds of hours and we still spend that amount of time assisting many of our legacy businesses during the pandemic, ranging from updating their businesses to survive in the digital era to helping them apply for recovery programs. We are valuable links in connecting our small business community with the various government programs that have been created to support them, and we will continue to play that role for this program as well. Um, my colleagues and I, we're very excited for this legacy business program um, that will be developed, and we hope that there will be sufficient resources in, within the program budget for community-based organizations to get the word out to qualifying business, businesses and to help them with the application process. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Caller, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller, are you there? Yes. Hi. This is Naya Segura from Bacerec Legal Services. And I would like to speak about uh, item number four, um, the Legacy Business Program. Okay. Uh, Legal Services. Uh, at the Telegram Services, we work and support small business owners and entrepreneurs from communities in need, and this legacy business program will support uh, these business. We would like to address uh, some of the recommendations that also another coalition of organizations provided, and uh, would like to discuss the implementation of the program 
to include different ways in which a, a small business owners um, can support the application for the for the program um, by basically providing other types of documentation and just helping these small business owners to access uh, this program. We are very happy to be here and support this program. Thank you. Caller, please state your name and the items you like to speak on. Caller, are you there? Mr. Chair, there's no more callers. All right. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you for those uh, for those uh, comments. Um, that will close the public comment at uh, this time. Members, we're going to recommend that we uh, that we take items one, two, nine. 10 and 11 uh, on consent. Uh, that we note and file item three. And that we continue item seven. One, two, nine, 10, 11 on consent. Note and file item three and continue item seven. Unless there's some objection or other concerns. Okay, well, seeing that, that will be the order. Uh, Mr. Clerk, would you read item four for us, please? Item number four is continued from March 22nd, 2022. Economic and Workforce Development Department report relative to the establishment of a legacy business program in the city of Los Angeles. Okay, this is a, a program that we introduced uh, back in 2019, so it's been several years in the making. Uh, I think uh, even even more meaningful with the uh, action taken uh, last week uh, in, in support of local businesses and contracting that was a, a measure that uh, I think is going to be very helpful. Um, but let me bring uh, EWDD to the table. As I said, we first started talking about this several years ago. Uh, can you run us through what you've learned in your research regarding other legacy business programs? Uh, throughout the state and even around the country. Uh, I've got a couple of follow-up questions before we ask uh, our colleagues to comment. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, Council Member Price, and members of the Economic Development and Jobs Committee. Um, in 2019, uh, the Council directed EWDD to report back with analysis of legacy business programs implemented in other cities and to make recommendations regarding the implementation of the legacy business program here in the city of Los Angeles. And so today we're reporting back um, on legacy business programs managed by the cities of San Francisco and San Antonio and providing recommendations uh, to implement a program here in the city of Los Angeles. Based on staff research, um, legacy business programs in other cities um, fit into the following general criteria uh, categories. Uh, promotion, promotional activities, technical assistance, and or financial assistance. The uh, initial council motion back in 2019 requested that EWDD study San Francisco's legacy business program. In recent years, other cities have also created new legacy business programs based on San Francisco's model. San Francisco initiative was inspired by a 2013 report by the historic preservation nonprofit San Francisco Heritage on legacy bars and restaurants. Uh, the following year, San Francisco's budget and legislative analyst office showed that closures of small businesses have reached record numbers in large part due to escalating commercial rents. Um, legislation and a ballot initiative were introduced in two phases. The first phase was the creation of a legacy business registry, followed by a ballot initiative to create a legacy business historic preservation fund. Through the Legacy Business Historic Preservation Fund, businesses on the registry were allowed to receive grants of $500 per full-time employee per year, while landlords who extended the leases of such businesses for at least 10 years would receive rent stabilization grants of $4.50 per month. Um, 
per square foot of space lease per year with a, up to a maximum grant, uh, annual grant amount of $50,000 per business or $22,500 uh, per property owner. Funding for the program was guaranteed through the approval of the ballot measure. Um, however, increased participation by businesses in recent years has led to the reduction of assistance levels from $500 to $125 per employee per year. Uh, in the city of San Antonio, Texas, they launched its legacy business program in 2018, and they have two components. One is a special program coupled with UNESCO World Heritage Site, and a second program which is citywide. The legacy business says that are listed on the registry and located within the World Heritage area of the city are eligible for a, a grant pilot program. This provides facade, signage, parking lot, and landscape improvement matching grants along with opportunities for low interest building infrastructure improvement loans and access to capacity building programs. In its citywide program, the city of San Antonio offers non-monetary benefits, including marketing and promotional opportunities, technical assistance, such as finance, education classes, and access to architectural design advice. Businesses may also uh, qualify for development fee and or water and sewer fee waivers. In structuring uh, a licensing business program for the city of LA, EWDD recommends that uh, you authorize us to create a legacy business program within the department to be administered in partnership with the Department of City Planning and its historic uh, Office of Historic Resources. Our legacy business program will be celebratory and not regulatory. It will identify and designate businesses for the purpose of providing uh, recognition, assistance, and guidance. Um, the City of West, uh, our proposed uh, legacy business program would include seven components. First, uh, a legacy business designation and registry through the City Planning's Office of Historic Resources will create a simple application process for businesses to be included on a legacy business registry. A legacy business will be defined as a business that has been in continuous operations for 30 years or more within the same community at a physical location open to the public and that additionally meets one of the following two criteria. A, it contributes significantly to the community's history or identity, or B, it sustains and cultivates distinctive cultural traditions or practices. Uh, the Office of Historic Resources will biannually review applications, provide staff recommendations for inclusion on a leg uh, legacy business registry, and submit all documentation to the Cultural Heritage Commission for consideration and approval. Uh, the Cultural Heritage Commission will then proceed to the City Council for final approval of the legacy business registry. The second component includes technical assistance. Uh, legacy business registry will, um, those legacy businesses on the registry will be offered a suite of enhanced technical assistance uh, uh, services through from EDD, EWDD, and we will solicit a contractor to develop and implement a legacy business technical assistance curriculum with programs and courses specifically targeted for legacy businesses addressing topics such as succession planning and lease education. The third component is marketing and branding. The department's proposing to allocate up to $250,000 to cover the cost of developing a marketing and advertising and public engagement campaign. Um, and then fourth component would be community-based partnerships. Um, EWDD, along with planning, would seek to develop new partnerships that could bring additional resources toward the support of legacy businesses. The fifth component includes uh, land use incentives. Uh, city planning would explore how other divisions within their department could further support legacy business through land use policies and programs. And then six, EWDD will work with the city department, other city departments to identify and provide procurement opportunities um, for eligible legacy businesses. And then finally, um, the seventh component is our legacy business assistance grants. Uh, through the Legacy Business Program, EWDD will deploy up to $3.6 million in grants to support up to approximately 245 businesses throughout the city. Um, EWDD proposes to appropriate um, up to $100,000 to engage a contractor for two years. 
uh, as I mentioned, to develop and implement a legacy business technical assistance curriculum, as well as um, for program administrative costs, we um, to adequately uh, manage the programmatic expectations, the departments um, are proposing to appropriate up to 967000 in funding for a combination of position costs. Uh, this concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer questions. Also, um, I have my colleagues, Daisy and Rosa uh, from UWDD, as well as Shannon Ryan, senior planner with uh, the planning department. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Jackson. Appreciate the, uh, the, uh, the overview. Uh, you know, from the very beginning, going back a few years, I always saw this as a business assistance program. Uh, I'm just curious, what was your logic for recommending that the planning department be in charge of reviewing the applications and recommending businesses to the legacy for the designation rather than your own department? <laughs> sure, uh, fair question. Um, um, well, the impetus for San Francisco Legacy Business Program was the historic preservation study on their legacy bars and restaurants, which led their Office of Small Business um, to launch their legacy program. Um, and then for the city of San, uh, excuse me, city of um, San Antonio, um, actually the program is housed within their Office of Historic Preservation. And so um, modeling after those two cities um, and then um, recognizing the, um, the experience of, of the planning department and Office of Historic Resources um, in evaluating and nominating um, sites for historic cultural monument status that goes through their Cultural Heritage Commission. That's why we came to the uh, recommendation uh, or, or the, to include and work with the planning department. Well, I, I think there's a sort of different interpretation that, that, I, that myself and others had uh, about this. I'm going to make some recommendations uh, and then like my colleagues to chime in. Sure. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to move that we adopt the business program and set forth with recommendations two and six and seven of Exhibit B with the following criteria. That EWDD will create an application process for businesses to be included in the, leg the legacy business registry and to be a quarterly review of applications and provide a staff recommendations to the Small Business Commission for inclusion in this registry. That the legacy business be defined as a business that has been in operation for 20 years or more within the same community and which meets three of the following four criteria. Contributes to significantly to its community's history or identity sustains and cultivates distinctive cultural traditions or practices. Business is not franchised but affiliated with a national corporate chain and they provide vital services, vital goods and services in a language and a manner that's culturally accessible to the community. Uh, also, I'm recommending that the EWDD give prioritization for inclusion in the registry to businesses that face an imminent threat of displacement and those businesses who are located in low-income areas defined as those with medium incomes under 50% AMI. And that additionally, the legacy business assistance grants will include use of funds to help legacy businesses negotiate long-term lease agreements with their landlord. Uh, and that the EWDD will deliver a contract to assist in marketing and branding of the program. Okay, I'm not trying to take anything away from uh, from our planning efforts, but I'm just trying to focus these resources with the department that's supposed to be doing these kinds of activities. Uh, we also recommend that we approve recommendations 1A, 4, 5, and 8 of the UWDD report. And that we approve the following recommendations authorizing EWDD to establish and implement a legacy business registry, including soliciting and reviewing candidates for designation of a legacy business, transmitting those recommendations for designation to the Small Business Commission for approval, that we further instruct EWDD to report to the Economic Development Jobs Committee on a biannual basis 
with a list of designated vaccines, the assistance that's been offered, and the results of the program and recommendations for improvement. Finally, uh, that we authorized use of up to $5 million of ARPA funds as follows for $4 million for legacy business assistance grants, technical assistance curriculum, marketing, and community, edu uh, community engagement, $500,000, and $500,000 for, for EWDD program costs. Then that we authorize the general manager of EWDD or designate to, de to negotiate and execute professional service agreements with third party consultants for up to $500,000 for assistance in implementation of this program. Those are the recommendations members I'm going to be making, uh, but this time I certainly welcome and, and invite your comments or suggestions. Mr. Nicorian. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. First of all, thank you for your vision and your persistence in, in seeing this through. I, I'm so excited about this program. It's, it's going to be uh, a great a great addition to our business community in Los Angeles. And thank you for your report and your work, Mr. Jackson, and, and all of the, the staff who worked on this. Um, I, I was going to recommend, as you did, Mr. Chairman, the 20-year uh, change. Um, I don't know if I caught all of the um, changes that you had proposed with regard to assistance, but um, I think what I heard was that whatever assistance we're, we're moving forward with now would be, um, we'd be appropriating ARPA funds initially at least to, to pay for those. Uh, and if that's the case, that sounds like a great idea to me. Um, I, I wanted to toss out a couple of ideas of potential benefits uh, in addition to the ones that are indicated for our legacy businesses. Number one, um, some sort of simple process by which they can be designated when they participate in LA ramp so that uh, when there are procurement opportunities, especially from outside of uh, the city uh, with some of our primes, for example, who are looking for, for subs and so forth. There might be some incentivization for them to integrate our legacy businesses into their larger contracts. Um, I wanted to also suggest, and maybe this goes without saying, but LA tourism certainly should be engaged in this process as well and provided with a list of legacy businesses so that in the promotional work that they do outside of the city for tourism, shopping uh, districts and, and so forth, restaurants that are listed, our legacy businesses should certainly be prioritized in that kind of outreach. And then finally, um, to the point that both um, Mr. Jackson and the chair mentioned about um, legacy businesses often being in um, survival mode and, and hanging on, um, often we hear from our business community that um, requirements, uh, for example, to meet some business and safety regulations and other sorts of things might seem inappropriate to a particular business. And when those are life or safety issues, of course, you know, or accessibility, those sorts of things, well, that's just the way it goes. But where things deal with, say, aesthetics or other issues, um, I can see situations where legacy businesses, because they are legacy businesses, should be exempted from um, those sorts of things. Uh, it, I think it, it will require you know, a deeper look to figure out whether there are such exemptions that we might be able to provide, but for example, relating to signage requirements. Um, there may be a very different kind of signage requirement that would be appropriate for a legacy business than would be appropriate for a five-year-old, you know, body shop or something next door. Um, and I think we should take a look at that. But other than that, those are, those are my thoughts. I don't think any of those thoughts require holding anything up in, in our moving forward with the chair's recommendations, and I'm, I'm eager to do so. 
Thank you, Mr. Gore. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, are recommending that the uh, business be in operation for 20 years or more. I think initially there was some discussion about 30 years. Uh, I agree. I think we need to bring, it, to bring that down a little bit more. Uh, you know, with, with the support of the budget committee, we were able to add 1.25 million back uh, for the uh, technical assistance piece, uh, and so we think that's going to be important. Uh, and, you know, we're asking for a biannual report back so we can kind of monitor this program as it in real time, if you will, to get an idea of who's being selected, what kind of assistance is being provided, and if it's adequate and, and, and if it works. So uh, I, I think that uh, your, your comments certainly were timely. Over the past several months, we've had conversations with a number of organizations and individuals who have chimed in, who made specific uh, suggestions about the initial draft, and uh, it's really been incorporated into the recommendations that I'm proposing at this time. Mr. Marquise Harris Dawson. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and uh, congratulations on bringing this uh, to the place uh, that we are. Um, and congratulations to everybody on the council, especially uh, Chairman Koretz on the uh, local business uh, preference that uh, the voters supported last week. I think this is part of a bigger package. Um, but, you know, my comments are similar to those of Mr. Krikorian. Uh There are lots of legacy businesses. I think a lot about the legacy businesses that are in places like, you know, my district, and I think all of us have places like this in our district, where the economy or the market is changing in their location. And they, you know, where they've been maybe a neighborhood business, now that location, you know, has lots of different kinds of traffic. Um, and one of the, some of the main challenges that come to my office from those kinds of businesses have to do with building and safety. Um, so I was happy to, I was actually happy to hear about planning and read the planning is playing a central role. But I wonder, uh, Mr. Jackson, had you all thought about uh, building and safety, certainly as they are changing design uh, standards that are happening, you know, Mr. Krikorian re referred to signage, but there are a host of other things uh, that happen in place uh, that we're generally supportive of, but we don't want to do them in a way that drives out uh, our, our uh, legacy businesses. So I wonder if you could speak to that. I can imagine that that was also a particular challenge in uh, San Francisco. Yeah, we we have not had conversations with the building and safety department, and definitely as we continue to, to do more investigation as we set up and launch this program, we would have those conversations with building and safety. And uh, prior to the launch, we definitely can come back to you um, with uh, more information on how we can address your areas of concern, um, as well as the entire uh, uh, committee's concerns before we launch. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Marquis, Sarah Dawson, uh, for those comments. Uh, everyone should have received a copy of the proposed amendments, so you can kind of take a look at them. Uh, thank you for your for your input, Councilmember Blumenfeld. Great, thank you. And I'm trying. I'm looking over the amendments right now. Obviously, I haven't had a chance to really digest them, but it, it's my understanding that the you you're taking it out of playing and putting it back into DEWDD, is that right? That's correct. Okay. That's my intent. And, and that is, will that also cut the ad, admin costs in half? Because right right now we're talking about, or as originally put, it was about a million dollars to administer about five million. It was about a 20%. But if you if you take it out to EWDD, does that cut it down to a 10%? Uh, yeah, you know, it, it will cut it down, but we added some more. We added some additional funding to it as well for contract services. So what's the total admin hit on this program? I, I, I mean, I'm, I can ask the staff that in terms of... Yeah. So yeah, in terms of uh, program admin costs from EWDD, we're looking at, um, with with the amendments, um, would be close to half a mil, million dollars, $500,000. Uh, okay. So it's about five hundred thousand to to administer about five million dollars worth of program, right. a little bit more, which is not it's not bad. And and, and Mr. Price, I, I I should have started by saying uh, I really congratulate you bringing this forward. I think this is great, and 
uh, again, you're, you're really taking leadership on some of these important uh, business issues. But uh, so so that, that's good. So the admin costs are coming down on this because um, that was something I was a little concerned about. Now the, the mapping the fifty percent. Uh, immediate income priority. So you have a prioritization for inclusion of businesses uh, who are located in the low-income communities. Uh, I just want to make sure that that, you know, as I raised before, sometimes I worry about, or I often worry about the low-income communities in districts where they're surrounded by higher income areas. And, you know, in my district, I've got Canoga Park, uh, which, you know, competes on the poverty index, sadly, with anywhere in the city. Uh, and Reseda also has, has uh, some low-income areas in it and, and Prince of Winnetka. And I want to make sure that they are, they are included in this, that they're not weeded out because of their proximity to higher areas. Is there a map that shows these areas that I could look at? Or is, can I get some assurance that these communities are included? Well, I'll give you the assurance we don't have uh, a map, but again, happy to. You certainly have my assurance, Councilman, <laughs> that your area is going to be included. That's why Mr. Jackson continued, but certainly the intent was not to exclude, but it's got to be more inclusive. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely not to exclude it, at all. But you know how, this, you know how it always happens. It's, it's a definition of, of how big that community is or what, what area you look at. So I just want to make sure that we're granular enough that an area like Canoga Park or Reseda, that, that will certainly qualify under the 50% AMI, will qualify, will not be disqualified because of their proximity to, to Woodland Hills. Yeah, it is our, our preference and our intent to um, assist those businesses in those areas, even though they may be surrounded by a more mm, affluent area. Um, and so um, we intend to, to make sure that there's an equitable distribution of the grants. That, that, that community is defined small enough that... Small enough, correct. Okay, great. Uh, those are the two issues I wanted to raise. Thank yeah, you. And again, thank you, Councilman. Those are the issues around the you know, prioritization. We're not trying to exclude anybody. Just make sure that they're included. And we're going to be coming back... I want to make sure that they're prioritized as well. That, that if the priority is to go after 50% AMI, then it's any area that has 50% AMI. Correct. And we'll be coming back with a report every six months to monitor how, how well that's, that's been occurring and to make adjustments if we need to. Great. Thank you. Any other, uh, any other comments? I've been joined by uh, Councilwoman Rahman. She was here. Oh, there she is. Yes. No, I'm, I am here. Sorry about that. I just turned off my camera accidentally for a moment. Um, no, just sending, uh, uh, repeating... Uh, the congratulations from everyone else here. The discussion today has been really robust, and um, the comments made earlier, I think, have addressed all of the, the very minor concerns that I had or questions that I had. So really excited to move ahead with this. And again, congratulations to you, Councilmember Price, for moving this forward. Well, I mean, the direct goes to all of us. I know we all have been supportive of this, this conceptually, and I'm glad we were able to move it forward. Uh, I'm even willing to add another uh, instruction here to instruct ED, EWD to work with city tourism, building and safety and planning, uh, uh, and other relevant departments on ways to provide additional assistance to, uh, to businesses uh, and to report back to this committee on those efforts. Um, yes. So with that, do I need to, to uh, read these amendments again, or have they been distributed adequately, Mr. Lewis? I am seeing an email here with the bulk of it, and then we'll combine it with what you just uh, told us, further the further instruction. Does that cover that? Hey, let's call the roll, please. Very good. Councilmember Price? Aye. Councilmember Krikorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield? Let me feel that. Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. And Councilmember Raman? Yes. Very good. Hey, Raman, thank you. We're thank you. Making, we're making history again, and we're serving the interests of our, of our business community, large and small, uh, and those who've been around for a long time, especially. Uh, I want to thank EWDD for the report, uh, Mr. Jackson and team. Uh, thank you for your 
for your report uh, and for your ongoing efforts uh, to bring this program into fruition. Uh, we appreciate your uh, guidance, your leadership, your professionalism, and your support. Thank you. Can we move on to item five, Mr. Clerk? Item five, motion, Raman Price Wesson, relative to enabling more employee ownership in the city's local business sector. Okay, we've had uh, employee ownership workshops in CD9, and I think this will really be a part of an expansive program. Councilwoman Raman, is something, uh, I know this is a, has been an interest to you. Would you like to comment? Yeah, sure. Um, and actually, Councilmember Price, the work that you've done in your district was really the inspiration for um, putting this motion together. I thought it was really exciting. Um, and I wanted to thank you and your team for your partnership on, on this item. It's been really, really exciting to work with you um, to, to put this forward. I just wanted to provide a little bit of context uh, for this motion, why I was really excited about thinking about it. So. Um, there are a number of, uh, of businesses that are owned by uh, people from the baby boomer uh, generation uh, in Los Angeles right now. And uh, a, a number of economists have been looking at this issue and um, thinking about what happens as uh, these business owners exit the workforce. How are they going to plan for their businesses? And um, there, you know, there's there's studies that have shown that there might be a large scale loss of small and independent enterprises, um, and a number of studies have shown that a lot of these businesses and business owners lack succession plans for their businesses, and so there is a real opportunity right now to think about how these business owners can actually sell to their existing workforce. Uh, locally owned businesses recirculate a lot more of their profits within the local economy. An abundance of evidence shows that workers and employee-owned firms have significantly higher wages and better benefits. So this is really, you know, I think this could be an opportunity as we are at this moment where so many of these businesses are transferring ownership as they're turning over to use um, the experiences that you've had in your own district, Councilmember Price, um, and kind of the, the expertise and learning that has come from businesses that have done this in other parts of the country um, to try and push for more of this here in Los Angeles. And I think it could, it could be very, it could be a very, very exciting um, support system for, um, for, for some of these businesses to ensure that they continue to be businesses that really enrich Angelinos. So I'm excited about this. I think there's real potential here for change, particularly given where we are generationally. Um, and where, uh, where so many people in, who are business owners are in their own lives and their own careers. Um, and I just want to make sure that we're being proactive and thinking about this. Um, and uh, as I said, I think, you know, the work in your district, Councilmember Price, has been really inspiring. Well, thank you. Thanks for, your, uh, thanks for the comments. Thanks, to, thanks for your leadership and thanks for your interest in making sure we can make these programs available on a wider basis. I, I agree there. It's a... It's not for everyone, not for every business, but for those who can take advantage of it, it really has a chance to sort of leverage some limited resources. And it fits well with our legacy business uh, motion, I think. Uh, yeah, very, very much related. Very much related in spirit to that. All right. Any other comments, uh, members? I'll move that we uh, adopt the, uh, the motion. Mr. Clerk. Uh, yes, Councilmember Price. Aye. Councilmember Kerkorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Robin. Yes. And Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Very good. It is approved. Thank you, members. Item six. Item six motion Robin Price Kerkorian relative to implementing a community development tax incentive in the city of Los Angeles. Uh, again, I think this could be an opportunity for us to uh, return funds to the community, <laughs> give, give, the money, give the money back in, in some ways. Uh, in, in CD9, we were able to, to redistribute uh, almost five, almost $6 million uh, under a community grant program, going back to community organizations, nonprofits, state-based, community-based groups that were doing a variety of projects and programs in the district. Um, but they obviously will need to support uh, local organizations, help to elevate them, and a program like this 
might be a way to do that. Uh, any comments? Uh, I mentioned I mentioned uh, District uh, Nine. I, I know District Eight has also uh, embarked upon some similar uh, similar efforts. Mr. Blumenbell. I like this in concept. I'm, I'm curious about how, how do we define the CDOs? Um, I always worry about certain organizations getting getting locked into that and then and then getting our tax dollars. Is there is there any control over that, or what, what's the definition uh, of a CDO in this for for this part of concept? Um. Uh, I can I can provide a little bit of context on that. Yeah, let's get that. Is that all right? Yes, please. Yeah. Well, so I think part of what the motion is requesting is to put some of that put some of that definitional work together. And so I think if you have inputs, Councilmember Bloomfield, on you know what kind of organizations you would want to support through this, or what kind of organizations deserve to fit into this kind of framework, I'm uh, I think. I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that, but um, the motion language itself looks to the example um, in in Philadelphia, where this model has been put together and was very successful, and asks for organizations that have a demonstrated history of community work that's really focused on broad-based economic development initiatives and that hasn't led to displacement of residents and businesses. It also asks for um, organizations that have a track record of financial transparency, of annual reporting, and kind of, um, you know, s basically some measure of accountability for those organizations that exist and that have that has existed for a number of years, um, and that there is some demonstration that the community that the organization is seeking to serve is represented in the leadership of that organization or in the governance of that organization in a meaningful way. So those are the three criteria that we've, that I, that we've included, uh, Councilmember Price and I included in the language of the, of the motion already, but I think that there are certainly opportunities to continue to define and make clear what kind of organizations would be eligible for this kind of opportunity and to um, figure out how to ensure that the you know wh who we're giving to are, are, is really supporting um, yep. supporting you know goals in Los Angeles. Sorry, sorry, Councilmember Price. Well, no, no, excuse me, excuse me. I'm just going to say, uh, as you mentioned, that it's modeled after Philadelphia, but we still need to do some tweaking. And so, uh, all the details are not in place, Bob. Still room for yeah, uh, 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 your input and, and some ideas. I want to see it definitely move forward. You know, I, get, I just. I think the definition is going to be important. Um, I agree, because you know this is because this is a one for one with our tax dollars, right? Yes. So uh, somebody gives it to one of these CDOs, and that's a tax dollar that we're not getting, that we don't, we do not get to control. Now, the the theory I would think though is that by allowing them to give directly to a, a CDO, they're also going to get a tax break on that dollar. So they're going to be incentivized to to do that. Um, so it's a, it's a win for the folks who are giving those dollars uh, because instead of giving it to us, they're going to give it to a nonprofit, um, and they'll get an additional tax benefit. But from our perspective, I mean, we want to give it to these CDOs. We could just take their tax money and give it to those CDOs ourselves, uh, and and have act actual control over where these dollars go. But by doing it this way, we, we lose some of that control, but we're trying to, I guess, we're trying to pull more money toward those CDOs than might otherwise go as, as a, a lost leader, so to speak. That's that's the way I'm looking at this. But, and I, I'm just riffing on it because I'm looking at it saying, I, I like the idea, I, 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 I get concerned with losing control over our tax dollars. To be honest, that's that is a concern of mine because 
every dollar we lose to this is, is money we can't spend on, on city programs or, or even on giving to CDOs. Um, but anyway, but I want to see move forward and, and, and the devil's in the details and we'll see, see what happens at, uh, when we get the report back. And, it, you know, and also, you know, we talk about creating relationships between CBOs and community-based organizations, sorry, community-based organizations uh, and, uh, uh, and departments uh, in ways that we haven't before meeting these needs. And so we have some work to do, but this is an important start, I think. Councilman Rahman, your, your hand's still up? Yeah, uh, yeah, I just wanted to provide just... Um you know, one additional comment in response to Councilmember Blumenfield's um, uh, remarks. I, I think that's totally right. That you know, thinking about accountability, thinking about how we use, how we lose, you know, how we ensure that we're that these dollars are being used towards the best um, outcomes for Los Angeles. Uh, the hope, I think, is that this will bring benefits to neighborhoods without a significant administrative burden for city departments. And, and I think the long-term hope is that additional, that, the, that this program, because the work that would be supported through it would be uh, employment generating, would be, um, would be economic, you know, would, would basically enhance economic vibrancy in a particular neighborhood, that it would ultimately you know, generate more tax revenues for us over the long term, although I think that's, you know, in the short term, I think that's probably not going to be true. Um, and I think if we can find those activities that are, those organizations and those activities that they're engaged in that are the most fruitful for our neighborhoods, I think this can be very, a very powerful, um, a very powerful program as it was in Philadelphia. Good, yeah. yeah. And, you know, and the idea of a, of a nonprofit working with the business, uh, you know, kind of cutting out the middleman, I think is a good deal if, if those funds are used in a way that really benefits the community. Mr. Blumenthal, is there a backstop on how much, you know, let's say we do this and it's, it's massively successful, um, you know, and, and businesses prefer to give their money to CDOs than to the city. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we, I think we cap it at a certain amount per year, right? So at least to start? Yes. I'm not sure what that cap is. And I guess for staff, you know, what, what is the cap and, and how is that monitored? $5 million, I think, is the number I saw. Is it $5 million? Okay. Well, that's... that's that's a good. That's a good. I mean, that's a reasonable number to start, and, and maybe we yes. it's a success when we just keep growing it, uh, and that's that's great too. But I do, uh, I am glad that there is a there is a cap just in case there is a, um, you know, a really? scale of a loophole here that, that we're gonna you know see all of our tax dollars go by. Yeah. Us. So, uh, okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gregorian. Hey, thank you. Mr. Chair, thank you, Ms. Roman. Uh, this is very, 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 very early on, so um, no need to belabor it too much. Uh, but I do just want to flag that one factor that I think would be very important in making such a program a success is ensuring that it's structured to require specific measurable goals that the community development organizations are expected to meet. Benefit to the community is not going to work. Um, it's going to have to be something very specific about, you know, what we expect to, to see from them in order to essentially be subsidizing them. Um, and, and, it, and that needs to be measurable. Um, and then I think as there, there also needs to be an evaluative process built in so that those businesses that are the most successful in delivering, I'm sorry, the, the CDOs that are most successful in delivering the, the benefit that is the is the objective of our policy um, are um, encouraged you know or continue to be a part of the prop uh, of the, of the uh, program and those who are less successful or not successful maybe are reconsidered for future consideration uh, in engagement in the program just to, because 
I mean, Bob's right. This is an this is a tax expenditure, and we just want to make sure that the tax expenditure is actually producing the results that we we hope that it would would give. In the same way that, for example, the chair will remember will remember the you know clamor that we had a number of years ago to eliminate the business tax altogether. And the business community contended that, well, if you just get rid of this, uh, the gross receipts tax, lots of new businesses will pour in and, you know, it'll more than make up the loss. And, I, you know, in my view, that was provably not true. Uh, and we would have lost an enormous portion of our budget and not have received a like benefit in terms of revenues. So I just want to make sure that as we move forward, if we're setting aside or foregoing a portion of, of the gross receipts tax that, that um, produce a measurable uh, result that is, you know, is what we hope to achieve with our policy. Good comment. Mr. Blumenfield, I use put your hands yeah, up. One, one last thing just to put out there for staff uh, as they're putting this together, which is, um, and trying to flag this in advance, that we make sure that the that there's the uh, ethics stuff is, is in there, so that that there's some firewalls between the businesses and the and the CDOs uh, that you can't have the same uh, ownership. You can't have the same. Uh, it can't be a subsidiary of that business. Uh, I don't I don't know all the ins and outs of it, but I'm just thinking ahead to problems a lot of a lot of businesses have have nonprofits that actually help their business or, and and while there may be a role there I'm just as I'm thinking this through I'm just trying to prevent problems in advance so I, I put that out to the staff to, to to put some boundaries around that as well so that there are some some firewalls between the business itself and it, its relationship with that CDO Right. Good comment. I'm sure uh, Mr. Jackson and his team are listening carefully. Any other comments? Mr. Clerk, would you take a vote? Uh, yes, Councilmember Price. To adopt, to adopt the motion, please. Councilmember Price? Aye. Councilmember Krikorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield? Let me feel that. Councilmember Robin? Yes. And Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Very good. That's approved. Thank you, members. Item 8. Item 8, EWDD report relative to changes to the Jedi Zone establishment policy. Okay, Jedi Zone, uh, another important tool in, in the toolbox. I'm going to, uh, I think, uh, ask Daisy to uh, begin and uh, report back with recommendations for changes. I can't hear you. Daisy. I've never seen that symbol, but uh, try it now. Yeah, I'm trying. Now. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Now we can. <laughs> okay, good. I, I apologize. I was having sound check problems earlier, and I do apologize. I'm glad you can hear me. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Daisy Hernandez with the Economic and Workforce Development Department. Before you is a report requesting your approval to update uh, the policy to establish jobs and economic development incentives at Jedi Zone. The Jedi program provides incentives, services, and resources to businesses to promote economic opportunities in areas of the city that are generally underinvested. The current establishment policy requires us to evaluate an area's eligibility based on primary qualifying criteria. 
To establish a Jedi zone, the area must meet one of six primary qualifying criteria, including the Structural Financing District, or EIFD, in a Community Revitalization and Investment Authority District, CREA, or being one of the focus areas identified in our says, which is the Citywide Economic uh, Development Strategy. Uh, the area can be eligible also if the, they meet five of the six approved economic needs criteria. Through this report, we are recommending two changes to the existing policy. In some cases, the boundary of a proposed Jedi zone splits the commercial corridor where businesses on one side of the street are eligible under the primary qualifying criteria, but businesses right across the street are not. Um, so what we're recommending is that in these instances, that we extend the Jedi zones to include both sides of the street since the economic conditions and the area impact both sides of the street of the commercial corridor. The second uh, recommendation for revising the existing policy is for the qualification uh, that we use to establish eligibility under the economic needs assessment. Under this criteria, we evaluate six factors indicating economic needs, including unemployment, low income in the area, existing blight, the percentage of um, commercial industrial land use, priority projects in the city, and whether the proposed zone is located in a former redevelopment project area. The current policy requires us requires that the proposed Jedi zone must meet five of these six criteria in order to qualify. In efforts to expedite deployment of assistance in these areas of high need, EWDD is recommending to update the policy to require areas to meet four of the criteria instead of five. Uh, approval of these two amendments to the existing policy will make the Jedi Zone, uh, the programs and incentives more accessible to these areas and allow us to carry out the program more effectively, promoting you know, job creation in these areas of the city. This concludes my presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, uh, members, any questions? At this point. Daisy, can you tell us, uh, have any approved zones been implemented yet? What's the status of the, I know there are about three or four that have been uh, oh, established uh, Jedi zones and we are excited to report we have been meeting with with the council officers to start promoting and doing the outreach for these established um, areas we're excited about that we are also in the process of evaluating the other requests for the other I believe we have four more requests for four different areas so we are moving right along and excited to to finally be moving forward with the program I just wanted to thank you um, and your team, Daisy, because uh, this had come out of, um, I think, some of the challenges we were facing in, in Council District 4, um, where one side of the street, businesses on one side of the street were qualifying, but on the other side they weren't. And I wanted to just express my gratitude for um, your work in trying to ensure that that kind of, you know, essentially kind of in irrational <laughs> line, drawing that kind of arbitrary line doesn't make sense. And so we're, we're grateful to you and, and, and the team and look forward to um, uh, establishing the zone and, and ensuring that it, it is, um, is a benefit to our constituents. So thank you. So thank you to you and your office for, for working with us on this and to, you know, we're uh, glad to be able to, you know, hopefully make it work and waiting for your consideration on this. Yeah. Okay, again, thank you, Daisy, for the report. Members, any other questions? We're going to move that we approve the EWDD report recommendations. Mr. Clark? Councilmember Price? Thank you. Aye. Councilmember Kerkorian? Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield? It was your life. Councilmember Rahman? Yes. And Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Very good. Okay, members, that item is approved. Thank you.
Item 12. Oh. Item 12, EWDD report relative to the selection of contractors as Los Angeles Business Source Center operators for the South, South Los Angeles and West Valley service areas. All right, do we have a report? Yes, we do. Um, good afternoon, Chair and Council Members. Uh, Rosa Pinalosa with Economic um, Economic Workforce Development Department. We are here to request your approval um, of contractor selection and execution of contracts pursuing the results of the 2022 Los Angeles Business Source Center Operators uh, request for proposal in the South Los Angeles and West Valley service areas. In March of 2022, EWDD released an RFP to procure operators in South LA and at South Los Angeles and West Valley. EWDD is recommending the selection of two operators um, and requesting authority to negotiate new contracts commencing July 1st. Um, and EWDD is also requesting the authority to establish um, a replacement operator list that um, is attained that attained a satisfactory score of 70 points or greater. Um, and so uh, at this point, um, one of the things you should know is that uh, EWDD received a total of seven proposals, four for the West Valley area, two for the South Los Angeles area. And based on the evaluation and um, scores, uh, here we are now making our recommendations for our two final service areas. Um, and so that concludes uh, my report speaking um, and now open for any questions. Thank you. Okay, members, any, any final questions from the uh, yeah, I'll, I'm going to move that we approve the EWD report the recommendations as presented. Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Oh uh, yes, Councilmember Price. Aye. Councilmember Krikorian. Aye. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Councilmember Raman. Yes. And Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Very good. This matter is approved. All right. Thank you. Approved. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Clerk, is there anything else before us at this time? That clears the desk. This is clear, and ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.